Today we're going to talk about building smart Canadian networks and a new digital uh, opportunities for Canadians. So we're going to look at where we're at, what we need to do to be uh, a leader for Canada, to be a leader in, uh, in uh, smart networking. Um, so a little bit about us, uh, CIRA. So one thing we do is, so we run .ca infrastructure, and then we're a nonprofit organization. And then the other thing we do is we spend a lot of time and effort in building a better online Canada. And my part of that is uh, building, trying to build a Canadian infrastructure uh, coast to coast and of network uh, uh, internet exchange point. Um, so this is working with cities in building internet exchange point for cities, so smart infrastructure around that. It's around building a network, a community of people across Canada that care about building a smart infrastructure. Um, and all of this is changing the landscape in Canada. We need to get more uh, tier one. We need to have better connectivity inside Canada. Um, one thing, we, if you go to our website, you can see that a lot of traffic between Canadian flows through the US. And we're trying to bring that in Canada with this new infrastructure. Um, so I think over the last couple of years, we've been working with a lot of members of the community in building a vision for the Canadian internet. It's a bit, it's like a Canadian, the Canadian Railroad, coast to coast. It's building a smart network coast to coast where people can onboard that infrastructure to the internet exchange point. And it's being something smart that can offer on-demand networking uh, to support the new uh, internet. So, right now, CIRA, the initiative we're working on is uh, building new IXPs in pretty much all cities in Canada. So trying to build the community to support a smart infrastructure in Canada. And with St. Gen, Ottawa based, that's where we kick in, is we work with St. Gen to facilitate or trying to work partner in the ecosystem to create a better infrastructure for them to enable there are uh, programs in Ottawa specifically, and also through Ontario for the short term. Hello? Um, so that's it for me. Yes, so, go .ca. Um, I guess the first, uh, I'll ask each of you to introduce uh, yourself. I'm Paul Howard, I'm with uh, Rogers Communications. I'm part of our enterprise business unit responsible for our architecture. Yes, I'm not interested. Hi, my name is Peter Melanius. I'm VP of <coughs> Development at Canary. Um, some of you might know Canary, others might not. Um, we're funded by the industry department, I said. Uh, we run um, the backbone network for the National Research and Education Network. We do technology innovation on the network, and we support private sector innovation leveraging the assets of the network. And in that relation, we're a, we're a partner to send you. Great. I'm, uh, I'm Walter Meyer, and I'm with Telus. I am um, responsible for uh, our enterprise WAN service development, technology selection, and I'm our internal uh, evangelist for software defined networking. And uh, Ibrahim is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Mikhail Kantarjan. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Ottawa. Uh, my research area is wireless communications, so much talk about 5G, uh, content caching in uh, mobile edge, uh, and smart grid communications. All right, thank you. So first topic is, um, so how to position Canada as a leader in smart infrastructure? So like, how open, so what do we need to get there, to have an open smart infrastructure in Canada? Who's going? <laughs> I'm on, so uh, it's such a broad question. Actually, I, I want to start with uh, a positive message. I know some people think, you know, I think Canada uh, has some things that we need to do to improve on, but certainly from my lens, you know, I've actually done everything from flying telephone poles to corporate investing, uh, which that was a bit of an odd journey, I know, but I've always seen, uh, you know, incredible opportunity, and Rich, you certainly heard me speak a few times and say that there's an arc between uh, you know Quebec City all the way down into Windsor here in the eastern part of Canada that has, I think I counted once, 63 computer science engineering programs. Uh, there's an incredible amount of talent sitting uh, on top of that that's created you know this great ecosystem that we've got. Um, so 
you know, my message would be, you know, keep the momentum on, on that. I think we actually are graduating a whole pile of people. We probably lose half of them to other parts of the world. That's not a bad thing because, uh, you know, we bring in different folks from around the world, and I think we need to keep focusing on, on doing that. I would echo some comments I heard around um, how do we bring more of the business skills uh, on top of some of that excellent talent we bring out of the schools. And, um, you know, someone who's been involved in the startup community, I see all the programs and focus on um, the next generation coming out of the university, so that, that's great. Uh, there's not actually a lot of programs out there to take someone out of industry who's invested 25 years and it maybe uh, has to retire, put their own kids to the university. There's actually no program for them to, can, to actually incent them to leave that, to go and mentor and bring their business skills into the startup world. So if I was to pick one thing, it would probably be that. Um, that, you know, how do you, you know, what is the program that says I'm going to give you some tax relief or I'm going to give you credit or something like that. A top business executive out of banking or out of retail or out of, uh, uh, you know, somebody who has really deep skills uh, so they can go match them up. You know, we have some. We get people that have retired getting involved in the community, but we can get some of the folks a little bit before that stage um, married in with that great arc of talent that we've got. So, Peter? I resonate with that, and, and there, was, there was a lot of discussion this morning about um, you know the fact that 90% of, of R&D around telecom was, was conducted in this region, um, which is great, but it was also a threat. I mean, it's a signal with the change to more software control, our traditional capabilities have been under threat, and we need to we need to migrate and, and adapt, as Paul says, to to develop the next generation solutions to increase uh, traction here. Um, if you look at, at how we use technologies, it's interesting that uh, Canadian consumers are among the highest consumers, of households are the highest consumers of internet services. You could argue that we don't have sufficient bandwidth, but we watch more, we watch more video online, we touch more web pages, but our small businesses are really behind the curve in terms of using technologies. And we need to figure out a way, whether it's, it's training or support, to help people adapt and use technologies to improve kind of a chronic um, uh, productivity and efficiency cap. Yeah. Walter? Yeah, well, I totally resonate with that. And going back to something that Paul said about, uh, about talent development, is in a reference to, to reference to work that we did with, uh, with Sengen, like the, uh, with the SDM throwdown in collaboration with Juniper, um, bringing, uh, bringing a challenge statement in a, in, a, in, a, in a hackathon format to the students um, to have them come, you know, go deliver a solution, learn some new skills, deliver a solution, and then come back and present it. And not, not just from a technology perspective, right? But to think about the economics and think about the, you know, the, the go to market and, and actually have the, the presentation skills. And I think if we want to grow a young entrepreneur, uh, you know that that's one way to do it. Uh, you know the other the other thing I would say is that you know, if we've got this great broad brand infrastructure and you know and it's getting better all the time and I, I don't mean you know just mobile this way, but uh, our ability to open that up. Uh, you know, Raheem talked earlier about you know he he has a vision that you know if you if you're a startup you can come and, and you know get a slice of the network and, and work. But we've got to get the, the mechanisms in place to make that work easily. Uh, so that, and then, but that's exposing part of the network to APIs and whatnot, so that we can actually get that control. And, and I think that will also help with fostering innovation and entrepreneurship in Canada. So, Mel, so. Well, I think we can sit here and stay all day and talk about how good this uh, open infrastructure would be. And I think that's why we have so many people in this room interested uh, in Sanjan over here for this. Uh, and we can uh, assure about the benefits. And probably the challenge would be how to do it, the business models behind it. Um, I just want to make a comment. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at uh, the 5G Canada event, and we had a speaker from uh, Ericsson. And one thing uh, he said, anything could be a service, but we don't know it yet, probably. So beyond the traditional business models, maybe it's time to explore uh, could services be a part of it? What kind of new services could be offered uh, when we're thinking about this? So that, that can be considered and explored and made possible. Okay. Um, so for, from my point of view, when I look at the Canadian internet, I see a lot of the incumbents that offer internet services to subscribers. And a lot of the, the infrastructure is designed right now, north-south, that means there's a lot of connectivity and exchange of traffic in the U.S. 
So how important is it to bring that up in Canada? Is that part of the, the global vision for you guys? Or? Um, I mean, you mentioned it's I mean, it's not my area of expertise uh, specifically, but um, I, I do you know, echo your earlier discussion that it is something important that we need to think about in terms of Canada and where the traffic goes. A lot of, you know, we heard today that how much traffic's going to move to the cloud. I don't think people understand necessarily where that traffic goes. So when they connect to the internet, they don't really realize that it's getting maybe routed through Seattle or going down to Chicago, then all the way back up uh, through Winnipeg. Um, and, you know, I guess if you extend that out, if we really build this virtual eyes network infrastructure like we're talking about, we have to maybe think about what that really means. And I mentioned usually, I mean, I go back to the days when it was illegal to route your long distance to the US. Uh, but people did it with dialers anyway uh, to circumvent regulations. And once we virtualize everything in these networks, there's really nothing stopping other global carriers from shipping boxes into Canada and servicing our customers over our internet with all the high value that, uh, that we hope to capture itself. So, it's a good point. We, we do need to think about you know how we create a unique advantage for Canada by building out that inter exchange connectivity here. What do you? Yeah, I, I think there's there's probably a business opportunity there. As we all know, that, uh, you know, in, in recent years there's been issues around the U.S. Patriot Act. There's been concerns about storing data, the false issue and track routing it through the U.S. or storing it there. And, and in some ways, there's an opportunity for Canada to, to be a safe haven for for organizations that don't, don't specifically want their data to reside in Canada. Um, so if we think about moving, you know, moving apps to the cloud, and, and you know, there's a lot of talk today about um, Internet of Things and, and the uh, performance that's required from the network uh, for, 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 for those applications. It, and if, you, if you start to think as well as we're going to foster innovation and have uh, you know, different applications running over the top or different services running over the top, the network performance becomes important. So the closer we can get uh, applications to, to end users, the better off the, the that application will, will perform. And so, um, you know, we are working to push services up closer to customers within different communities, communities rather than just, you know, tier one, tier two cities, but you also can extend that to in interact between the different providers. So will get better peer review, uh, but then by extension, you'll have better performance of the network app. So I, th I, think, that's, I think that's a valid point. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> well, um, we're talking about traffic uh, flowing through Canada, but at the same time, they're talking about uh, Canadian traffic flowing over their networks. So we have to see the other side of the coin. And I think over here, I just want to make a comment about being ahead of the game is really important. Uh, it's the global competition in the end. We talk about Canadian innovation, Canadian uh, resources, but uh, we are acting in the global arena, all of us, academia and industry. We'll switch to the next topic. So moving technology and innovation forward. So, so where are we lacking in terms of smart infrastructure in Canada? Um, first hand. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, you know, actually, I want to bring up one kind of a pet project I think about all the time. One would be uh, how are we going to convince the public that we're going to build this stuff secure? so that it's always available. There's been some pretty huge um, IoT uh, attacks um, you know, of incredible magnitude that even some of the largest inter-exchange carriers have, you know, have struggled to maintain that amount of traffic. So um, you know, I would throw that back out to the vendors and the academics in the audience to really think about that as we're building out this virtualized infrastructure. Um, you know, we need to find a way to make sure, and it, it, maybe even back to you, Jacques, we have to fundamentally change the way the internet was built. Um, you know, we thought amplified attacks through DNS or time servers was an issue until suddenly somebody went in to all these uh, cameras, uh, you know, and built an attack that uh, was bigger than something we've never seen anything quite like that. 1.2 terabytes a second. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, we thought amplified attacks on DNS were a big deal <laughs> until we saw that. So I, I would say that's, that's definitely an area that as a community we should focus on and potentially Canada could solve, right? Because that actually requires fundamentally changing some of the actual infrastructure of the internet itself. So if I may, I'd like to, 
part of the thing with Migma.ca is that we're inside the cloud, and I'm going to say a word that nobody said yet, uh, IPv6, uh, the Internet of Things connecting billions of devices. That will never happen over IPv4 because we're out of addresses. And so far in Canada, only TELUS implemented v6, and Rogers and starting to work on that. Other than that, in Canada, it's pretty much 0%. So, comment, yeah. do you have anything to comment on that, IPv6? Well, so, um, as you mentioned, we, we were, uh, we, we were, um, we were early to the game. Uh, we started a long time ago with you know, all devices that go into the network, in the core of the network, must be, must be v6 uh, enabled. Uh, which precipitated after you, you know, advertising V6 routes um, and, uh, and and having you know posting V6 content. Um, I, I think you can extend the same. Just going to Paul's point about security, I think you can extend the, the, the same methodology to security. If it's not secure by design, if it's not built in with security, right? Uh, you know, small things matter, and uh, and and as we've seen with the recent attacks, if you have uh, uh, you know millions or tens or hundreds of millions of devices with low bandwidth, you can get a, you know, a huge amplification attack. So we need to make sure that those devices are, are secure by design as well. Many, you know, many, many consumer devices are not upgradable or easily upgradable, those sorts of things, right? So I think that's a call to the industry to make sure uh, as we put devices out there that, that you know, they can be secured. Um, kind of back to your point about V6, I mean, I, I think it's a scale thing, right? We um, you know, in, in the end, we offer services over both V4 and V6. It just comes down to, to, to the scale and availability of addressing and, and uniqueness of it. Um, I, I think there's an inherent security discussion there around, you know, now that I know what the, you know, what the device is, because it's uniquely, it's uniquely addressed, then you can probably you know, do better mitigation, right? Um, but you still, you still need the visibility and data and analytics to, you know, to, to bring that to fruition. Um, Bill? Um, well, I mean, I think it's inevitable. Uh, we have like, so many devices, we can't play with like v 4 anymore, so um, uh, we need to have it. Of course, security is a big problem, uh, and how to deal with all these device associations uh, and the header sizes is another problem because we're talking about low latency networks, smart infrastructures, critical infrastructures. Uh, how are we going to address all these things and then reach them in a low latency? Uh, fashion. So these are all questions that we have to find answers for. Yeah, so we have challenges in smart home, in smart cities, in smart province, in smart country, mm -hmm. and interconnecting all of these things together. Right, and that's the thing. When I hear that word smart, I always ask, how much smarter do you want? What is smart? Right, because we already have the things smart. But are we talking about science fiction, like everything talking to each other, programming themselves and things like that? Or are we talking about connecting people? We're almost there. So um, it will be step by step, of course, and all these, all these efforts uh, will contribute to that, for sure. Um, so next topic would be talent breeding ecosystem. So, so what's the next generation workforce needs to look like to support the vision or like in 2030? Um, well, starting with me again, I'll say, uh, you know, when I speak to, I've spoken to different academic communities, I usually, when it comes to innovation, I always say, you know, we need to separate this from invention, right? We, we do generate a lot of students that can do invention. We don't generate a lot necessarily in Canada that can do innovation. <laughs> and the types of people uh, that come out and are the innovators that we would hold up, you know, I think people would nod their head and say, you know, Steve Jobs was an innovator, Zuckerberg was an innovator, you know, going back far enough, maybe Bill Gates was an innovator. The one thing all of those guys have in common is they all dropped out of university. Um, and the reason they dropped out is because the universities weren't giving them what they needed uh, and wasn't fostering their innovator spirit and they just went out and did it on their own. And I'm actually sad, I was at an INT forum sitting in um, in a theater with you know a few thousand Harvard MBA students, uh, and they were asking the same questions of their academics. You know, why should we stay here and finish this? And these were all people who were just rabid, dying to get into the startup community. But you know, why should we stay? Uh, why shouldn't we just leave now uh, and start fostering this? So, um, you know, I, I think if I were to flip the whole thing upside down in talent. Um, when it comes to looking for people that really have the innovative skills, 
I don't think what they did in high school even matters. I think a personality test matters, and that would be the only thing that I would say is the requirement for you to get into post-secondary if you wanted to actually create an innovation program. Nothing to do with their mathematics, nothing to do with their science. By the way, I took my two favorite subjects were art and history, <coughs> which I took all the way through uh, high school, um, which is the highest grade that I ever achieved, by the way. I'm not even ashamed to say that. And I say I've done everything from telephone poles to corporate investing in about a two and a half billion dollar investment portfolio. So, you know, innovation isn't, you know, there are, you know, those other techniques we need. I'm not saying we should get rid of uh, all our applied science jobs. I need that. I need that. Six, those six or schools. We need the engineers, the computer scientists. But innovators are completely different. I don't think we're set up in our education system at all to target those kind of people and, and help help them grow. Yeah, that's a good point. Um... You know, one of the things we heard this morning is that you know, the, the traditional education system, you know, needs to be supplemented by co-op programs and proved to be successful in, in taking what, what what kids are learning in school and, and getting some grounding in that real-world experience. I think the other aspect is that um, you know, innovation by definition is a very broad term, and you know, I think with this audience, we we tend to think of technical innovation, but you know, we heard this morning from your colleague at Rogers is business process innovation, which can be equally or, in my estimation, more important because you're, you're, you're thinking about how to solve problems and then applying technologies to it, as opposed to starting with the technology and saying, what can we do with this? Um, you know, and that's probably um, more hands-on experience and mentoring than, than traditional education. Is. But you know, I think there's a need for both. Yeah, I mean, the example I'll give is, so, you know, Apple, we all know the iPad or the iPhone. And when I speak about it, I say, you know, what did they actually invent? You know, you know the, the glasses, Gorilla Glass from Owens Corning. The processor came from Samsung. The memory came from some Taiwanese memory company. The operating system, the free BSD. So what the heck did he actually invent? He didn't. He, he, he put it together in a unique way that had never been done before. Uh, and the innovation is what created the value. You know, in fairness, they put the graphical interface on and they had iTunes and things like that, which you know you could say were inventions, but it was the combination, it was the innovation of putting existing things together in a very unique way um, that drove the success. With bugs. Well, and, 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 I, and I think right, if you if you look at the iPhone example, it's actually the first iteration is probably an inferior product to say BlackBerry. Right. right. Um, but when you look at the integration and the user experience and the the app ecosystem and things that go around it. Right? And so, um, really, it, it, it's a bit of an you know, innovation on experience and an innovation on business model versus you know, a, a pure technology innovation. Right? Yeah. yeah, he had both. Let's yeah. be fair, right? Again, uh, as I was saying before, he had both. He had a bunch of smart engineers right. in there that were able to, uh, to do all that work, but they also had the innovation right. folks uh, that packaged it correctly. Ellen, what's your take on that? Well, actually, it's great to hear uh, industry's opinions uh, on this. And um, uh, telecommunications is one of the fastest paced uh, sectors. So it's a challenge uh, to be an educator in that field as well, because we have to be ahead of things. Uh, in terms of research, we have to do things five or eight years ahead, because when we start educating a PhD student, uh, when they go out, they have to be ready for new technologies. They have to be developing those new technologies. Uh, as for the day-to-day -day problems of the industry, we should be aware of them, and we should be um, helping our students uh, be aware of the state of the art. Hope programs, I think everybody appreciates them, uh, me as well. Uh, they're great. Uh, working together with the industry, uh, learning problems for us, and also industry working with us uh, learning things from us would help a lot. So talking, uh, having an open communication uh, would help a lot. Um, but I want to mention one thing. There are lots of new things going on in the education area as well, like entrepreneurial programs, uh, COPE, uh, this could be counted one, although not very new, uh, and also different learning and teaching techniques. And I think in our field, it's very, very important to teach or 
for the students to learn how to learn because things are changing. Today they're doing SDM, maybe three years from now they won't do it. So they have to be able to adapt to new systems. So I, I, I like calling this this way. We have networks reconfigurable. We're trying to do networks reconfigurable. So how do we do reconfigurable challenges like a software loaded on a person kind of uh, science fiction idea? Uh, but uh, somehow if we can do that, if we can uh, embed that into the students from you know day one, from their first uh, day at university or even high school, uh, that would be really, really valuable for them. So thank you. Well, I would just add, add one to that. I think that, um, you know, as we see interns come out and, we, and we, we, we've sponsored a number of interns and co-ops, we have a branch of engineering program. Um, generational experience is so important, right? The, having people have been through multiple projects and learning what worked and what didn't work. So as going back to Paul's point about, you know, creating inventors, if we want to create entrepreneurs, we have to, they have to have that, that spirit and that knowledge and have, you know, tried things learn from them, apply those learnings, right? And I think you know, we, we see that coming out of, out of the uh, you know, out of the universities. We also need to embrace that through co-ops, internships, and mentorships to make sure that yeah, they have sure. We don't teach sales. Somebody mentioned, you know, we don't have enough sales skills, but, you know, there's no, where's the apprenticeship program? And, and when we're competing in the U.S., don't you gotta remember, they had IBM, Xerox, Procter & Gamble, anybody who's ever worked for one of those companies knows that they ran you through 12 months and programmed you to be a sales person and how to know your personality, your customer's personality. And they, those people, you know, there's so many of them down there, they've all left and gone to these startups and, you know, that really helps them. We get a little bit of the satellite spin off from that, um, but we don't get the complete benefit uh, of it. But one, one last time, I do want to put a shout out again. You know, we're here because of SendGen. Um, uh, and the work they're doing, just how important it is. You know, Rich sent an email out to myself and, and the other members just with one of his co-op students saying, hey, looking for a new gig. Um, and, you know, we weren't fast enough on the fly, unfortunately, at Rogers, but the demand was so high for the talent that has been, uh, that, that is coming out of SendGen. So, you know, I certainly want the folks in, in government to hear that it's, it's desperately needed. Uh, and, you know, this gentleman, luckily for him, probably had multiple offers uh, from companies just to go to another six-month co-op because there's such a demand um, for that kind of skill set. So on that topic, how do we better prepare students to be to support next-gen networks? Um, well, I, I want to be fair to the academics here that I completely agree with your comment. You can't be always trying to teach your students you know, the latest and greatest. I don't think anybody uh, can keep up with all the different uh, language and skills that are coming out there. Um, so from an engineering perspective and the computer science perspective, I think we're doing an incredibly great job now. I mean, yeah, we complain in industry sometimes that students don't come out exactly equipped the way we were, but it would be impossible to have guessed the transformation of, you know, OpenStack, for example, and that suddenly everybody needs to know Python a lot better than they used to know, but now there's Lua, I mean, there's going to be infinite number of languages, so all we can ask them to do is keep doing what they're doing uh, and, you know, uh, make sure that they come out with the right foundation, uh, some of them they come out you know, with the knowledge of how to solve problems and, you know, industry is going to have to just educate them on their specific things that we need, but as long as they know how to solve problems, they'll, they'll be successful. So we would need the different kind of SendGen, right? SendGen for software defined network, SendGen for software as a service, SendGen for different components that are critical to our potential. Research. But for academics, like you're saying, it's a long, you gotta make a big investment in what you're gonna teach students over uh, a long period of time. I, you know, it's, it's a little bit much faster than to predict uh, perfectly what that's gonna look like. Um, you know, Jeffrey Hinton did, uh, came up with his deep learning algorithms with uh, some of his peer groups back in 2008. Who could have, you know, it sat there and did nothing for a number of years, even though he published his paper, and suddenly uh, people figured out that, hey, if we put it into GPUs, it's going to be, you know, it's incredibly powerful, and now, you know, we're all looking for deep learning experts. Um, so to have asked the academic community to, you know, we're probably all asking to crank out as many deep learning people as you possibly can. Uh, but five years ago, we've been asking for data scientists. Uh, so, you know, in, in fairness, we just need them to, to keep doing the fundamentals, and, and I think they're doing a great job. Yeah, probably. Um, 
you mentioned something that I forgot to um, say, I could add to that. Um, yeah, teaching the fundamentals and at the same time state of the art is actually our challenge and we're trying to overcome this. Yeah, but both are very important and we understand the importance of both the fundamentals. So, to create an open infrastructure, we're all service providers, we all have different infrastructure in Canada, and we don't really interconnect together. So, how do we work together to create an open infrastructure in Canada? Well, maybe, maybe I can start by just uh, saying we, we do work we do work together, right? And I think that uh, there is a there, there are there are national capabilities and regional capabilities, and there's you know, um, the, you know there there are, there is we do have IP peering um, domestically, um, and and you know there's competition. We we have a, a wholesale arrangement with each other. In many cases, for for last mile access and things like that. So, ha having said that, the question is, you know, how how ubiquitous is that? How how openly available is is, is that? If we want to foster uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, how do we you know how do we position that so that entrepreneurs can use the network so that it's seamless, so they can reach customers you know nationally, um, where some networks may be regional. And and I think that. Uh, in, in that light, there's, there's work uh, the industry can do around opening up networks through APIs and things. And, uh, you know, we, have some, uh, we, we have some APIs open, and there's some work that we've done with, uh, with Rogers a few years back on, on from NGSMA on, on one API. Right? So, I mean, there are initiatives like that that are sort of nascent, uh, but maybe not ubiquitous. And so there's, there, there's an ability to, to uh, expand those, I think. And, and uh, you know, we talked earlier a little bit about uh, business model problems. Right? Uh, and and we, we can't settle you know, every problem, uh, every, every new um, uh, business opportunity with a technology problem below you know, for, for connectivity where we have connectivity, right? So I, I think there's an opportunity for the industry there to open that up but for, for um, through initiatives like we're doing with Stengen and, and, and others, right, to, uh, to um, you know, interwork more, more openly as an industry. I, I pick up on that last comment. I think vehicles like Sengen are the perfect means of, of creating that, that cooperation and collaboration. Um, you know, it's often hard um, developing it bilaterally between between two competitors. Um, you know, I think what uh, what what Rich and the team have done uh, with the model here is is you know, selling the vision of, of something that's more important for Canada and, and getting folks to buy in. Um, they see the value to, to their own individual interests, but they also see that you know, we're, we're, we're doing this for the betterment of Canada, and it seems almost like a neutral ground where, where Sengen seems to be the aggregator. And, and, and you know, I, I think these, these are the types of initiatives we should be putting more effort into. Yeah, so, an example, working with Rich, uh, trying to connect different communities in Ontario. There's, to draw on paper, connectivity between networks is easy. But to actually get the packets to flow from one end to the other to Internet Exchange Point to different providers and all that, it's still a challenge that we need to address. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And that's not my point. It's, it's not it's not ubiquitous, but it, you know it's there. And I think it all ties together with the, you know, the, the peering question around the U.S. U.S. bound peering as well and domestic. Um, I, you know, I think, that, and, I, and I want to come back and give give uh, Sanjay the credit here because. Bringing and we were you know, we were excited early on about the program and and, and have been you know, been with Stengen for the for the four years. I uh, continue can, and plan to continue. Okay, just throw that out there. The um, but but you know but there's there's opportunities there to expand that right. And I think that's you know we can we can you know, take that across whether that's connecting centers of excellence across Ontario or whether that's expanding that across the country. Uh, and I think that's the opportunity for further collaboration across all the providers and. Uh, uh, you know the, the other centers of excellence connecting, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's deep learning with big data, with you know with health sciences. Or, I mean, I'm making stuff up now, but you know, as you you know, to pull those together so that we can we can drive innovation across different industries as well with with the network facilitating that. Okay, so now we're ten minutes in. So mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll, oh. I'll add uh, just sort of one thing to that. So. Um, as well to, I mean, of course we want to interoperate. I mean, people want to make a phone call, they want to use the internet, our customers want to connect to each other, they want to connect to the world. So, you know, at the basic level, you know, that is our goal to be there. I mean, we can't 
Uh, there are barriers though. One is I mean, we can't collude with each other. We'll be back for the stand uh days, right? I mean, we are incented to compete. So there's only so much we can do. So typically, uh, you know, we would rely on standards to allow us to interoperate with each other. And where this whole Apple card is getting tipped upside down is that there's been standards bodies working on, you know, the area that we're all here for today for a number of years. Um, but how did it solve all the problems that we have as, as service providers? It's not really consumable yet. And now it's getting to the point where there's, you know, uh, ETSI, you've got Ecom from, I think, at and you've got the Core Project, you've got, I mean, I just go on and on now of how many different standards approaches that there are. Uh, and yet we were, you know, as service providers, we've been relying on these standards bodies. Um, and the reason, the, you know, who's tipped over the Apple cart? Well, you know, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's others that don't care about standards just saying, we're gonna build infrastructure and we're gonna create it in a way that's most effective for us to deliver our service. We don't really care about anybody else uh, that's out there. And then when we're finished, we're gonna open source it so that you know, there's 30 million people on GitHub that are all programming and working on it. So the traditional vendors that were coming and supplying us that would have allowed us to interoperate seamlessly, uh, they're caught uh, because they were all trying to build to these standards and they were all trying to collaborate on these standards. Um, but that's not the way the market's moving. The market is being driven outside of the traditional standards bodies by the open source community. Uh, and ultimately that you know, makes it very, very difficult. So again, another opportunity for us through SendGen um, to be you know, working on some of those projects and, uh, and, and supporting the open source community around them and contributing our code the way we think uh, things ought to work. Uh, and then ultimately, the suppliers to all of us will start incorporating that, and then ultimately the interoperability will be there. The interoperability never, you know, traditionally hasn't come from Rogers talking to Telus and Telus talking to Bell. I mean, that was the Stentor days when we had that, and, and the traditional at and days before they were broken up. Um, so, you know, I, I think there, that's a broader issue for all of us um, to think about. So we've got a couple of minutes for Q&A. Uh, &A. Anybody's got any curveballs out there? Come on. Should we, should service provider in Canada have it? Should Canada? Oh yeah, should Canadian want it? Of course, the answer is yes. But the question was, should, should it be Canadian policy to keep traffic in Canada? Should we have a policy? So, there you go. Should we have a policy to keep Canadian traffic in Canada? So traffic that originates from Canada.
there's two sides. I mean, from an application perspective, well, you already touched on this, but obviously, you know, anybody's building applications, you want consistent latency and things like that, so you can track performance. So, you know, I can see advantages to that. From all the other policy perspectives, uh, you know, I think that genie's out of the bottle. It's, uh, there's lots of good reasons why you don't want traffic to be necessary. We talked about one, DDoS attacks and things like that. You, you always want the network to be able to find the best path to deal uh, with your applications. You know, notwithstanding that we need to make sure that we protect people's privacy uh, and the information, we should absolutely take steps um, to do that. Um, but there, you know, there's other methodologies and encryption and things like that that we don't. But I think it's a, a fool's game to try to chase that we want to keep data that starts in Canada and uh, and keep, you know maintain it inside Canada because we just know that it won't happen, right? There's no way to actually track that. Yeah, I would just top up to say that you know I think there's there's the performance aspect, and I think that uh, you know the, the the network will solve that where we have where where we have the peering. Probably better. The, the pairing is is uh, the, the completeness of the domestic pairing. It was probably uh, it's probably more complete with the, the bigger providers than all providers, right? And that, that may be part of your point, right? Is um, so from a performance perspective, yes. And then I think there are the, you know, the economic considerations of what, where you peer, right? It, there, there, are, there will be benefits to, to keep the traffic here where you have a domestic peer. Um, I, I think the reality, one of the realities of Canadian east-west uh, traffic is that uh, many of the fiber routes are, are non-domestic routes, right? And, and so the reality is the traffic will balance across a, you know, a domestic and non-domestic route through the U.S. Um, that's, that, that's, aside from a, from a potential privacy perspective, that, that's pretty good hygiene, actually, because you didn't even have geographic diversity in your network, right? So, but I, th I think the root of your point is, hey, if I've got, you know, if I've got, do I have a, uh, a, a common footing for all providers in Canada, all ISPs in Canada that have traffic, good, you know, good performing traffic across uh, across the domestic network. Well, maybe we can extend this question to traffic from traffic to data. You want to keep Canadian data in Canada? That's another question. Uh, and uh, we've been hearing all these talks, and one thing strikes me is. Uh, one sentence probably I can say: We need to have security. What does that mean? We don't have it, right? If we had it, we wouldn't have that sentence. So uh, if we don't have enough security, it's probably not a good idea. But uh, in terms of performance uh, and lots of other, for lots of other reasons, uh, from time to time, uh, especially insensitive data or traffic uh, could go out. That's the key. Another question? We got about a minute left. So it was commented. Okay, let's go. Uh, so it was commented earlier that um, as the industry is changing year by year, that it's difficult to have students uh, perfectly predicting what sort of technologies they should be researching into, uh, or what sort of education they should be focusing on. Uh, as a student, I'm. My question is, if are or are there any initiatives each of you are taking to make sure that? Uh, the next generation of academic talent is meeting the demands of the industry. Uh, I mean, myself personally, I can speak. I mean, I've um, done collaborations with the University of Waterloo where I've gone in and mentored students. And uh, as of today, I'm committed to going and uh, speaking with some students at Carleton and one of their computer science engineering programs and helping coach and mentor them through um, some of their projects around IoT and how to match up business cases to uh, their technology ideas. So yeah, I mean, industry um, uh, can can certainly collaborate and engage um, with, but we're not necessarily, you know, our our focus in business is always in you know what we can sell to our customers today, and it's kind of that top of the line versus the bottom line. We can spend a little bit of time thinking about the future. Um, but again, I think there's always great collaboration that can be had when we get people that generally just generally want to volunteer their time to uh, help that next generation to realize their goals. So I'll turn. Yeah, I mean, from a TELUS perspective, we have a few initiatives. One is we have a, a strong graduate engineering program. Uh, so we have 
so in, and through that we have campus recruiting and things like that. So in 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 setting the um, in, in setting the criteria for that and, and, and putting up recruitment, we're actually you know there's there, there's sort of a backwards notification of the sorts of things we're looking for. That, but to follow up, that, that that is kind of in the moment, right? It's like what, what problems are we solving today? Uh, we also support some research chairs and research initiatives across the country in different you know, different uh, institutions, and uh, and we have we have in, we support internships and, and whatnot. And, and, and again, it's going to come back to Sengen because uh, like I I got I know we're a little over time. Indulge me for one sec. We, at the throwdown, we had one particular student uh, who was was I mean, the students were all fantastic, but we had one particular student from McGill. Uh, that uh, was able to, you know, was very well rounded, was an engineering student, was doing a marketing rotation at, at Sengen. Um, but great, also great skills, had been rounded out through the process communications, being able to articulate what they were, what they were working on, the economics of it. So, I, you know, I, I think I would say if you extend that back into, in, into your own studies and, and those of your colleagues, you know, just learning to learn, but learn to be well rounded as well. Right and, uh, and 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 learning to communicate. And I think those those are the sorts of things you can take back. We certainly do that back into uh, back into our academic partners as well. But you know, to, to Paul's point, often that say we're trying to solve a particular problem over the next you know one one to five years, and that it, sometimes that can be a little narrow in scope. All right. So this concludes the panel. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.